What's going on guys, Justin here, and welcome back to our 11th example video following our course on abstract algebra. Now, today's example video is going to be on normal subgroups as well as quotient groups. So with my introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and get into our first example for today's video. So for this first example, I will be proving that these following statements about normal subgroups are equivalent. And that is for a group G and a subgroup N, we have the following statements are equivalent. So for our first one, we have for all little g and g and little n and n, we have that g n g inverse or just n conjugated by g is in big N. Our second one is for all little g and g, we have that the left coset g n is equal to the right coset n g. And lastly, we have for all little g and g, we have that our subgroup n conjugated by g is still equal to our subgroup n. Great. And so the first proof we are going to do is one implies two, and we're going to do this by a string of equivalences where we have one implies two, two implies three, and then lastly, three implies one. So let's go ahead and start with our first proof here, and that is going to be that one implies two. And so of course, to start this off, we are going to start by supposing our, for our one condition here, and that is for all little g in our group g, as well as for all little n in our subgroup n, we have the following, and that is that an arbitrary element of our subgroup N conjugated by G will be in our subgroup big N. Great. And so what we want to prove is that our left coset GN is equal to our right coset N times G. And we're gonna show that these two sets are equal using the method of double inclusion. So let's go ahead and do our forward inclusion there. And that is to say, we are going to show that our little G times N is a subset of N times G. Great. So to do that, let's go ahead and take an element from our left coset G times N, and we'll call that, let's see, G times little n. And like I said, that'll be in our left coset G times big N. Great. And so from here, I want to note the following, and that is that we have that G N is equal to G times N. And from here, we're going to write multiply by a creative use of the identity element, and that is going to be G inverse times G. Great, and you can see that that will obviously be equal to the identity element, so we're not changing our gn here, but we can just associate from here, and that will give us g times n times g inverse times g. And we can see that what we have in the parentheses here is an element of our subgroup big N, and we have a G out here on the right, which means that this is obviously an element from our right coset N times little g. Great, so that completes our forward inclusion there. We have shown that our set G times N is a subset of our right coset N times G. Great, so now we're just gonna do the reverse inclusion using the exact same method. So we're going to take an element from our other coset this time, N times G, which is in our right coset N G. And then just like before, we are going to use a creative use of the identity element to show that this is in the left coset G N. And so that means that N G is equal to the following, where this time we are going to have, where this time we're going to left multiply by G times G inverse, and that will give us G G inverse times N G. And once again, we are going to associate, so that'll give us G out front, and then we will have a G inverse times N times G. And once again, what we have in parentheses is an element of N. So this will be in our coset as we want. It'll be in the coset G times N. Great, so that proves that our set N times G is a subset of G times N. And with these two together, we have shown that the two sets are equal. Great, so from here, we're gonna move on to the proof, which is two implies three, or that is to say, we're gonna prove that having these two cosets equal to each other implies that the conjugation of our subgroup big N by G is equal to N still. So let's go ahead and get into that proof. So like I said, for our next proof, we are gonna get into two implies three. And so we're gonna suppose what we just proved here, and that is that for all little g in our group big G, we have the following fact, and that is that our right cosets and left cosets are equal. So G times N is equal to N times G. Great. So let's go ahead and use this fact to try and show our third statement. And our third statement is that for all little g in big G, we have that the conjugate of our subgroup N 
by g is equal to just n itself. And we're gonna do this by double inclusion once again. So let me go ahead and denote that here and we'll be doing the forward direction first. So like I said, using this definition, that means that for a given g in g and a little n and n, our big N, that there exists an n prime in our big N here such that the following holds. And that is that g times n is equal to n prime times g. Great. And so we can see that we can right multiply by g inverse on both sides and that will give us g times n times g inverse is equal to n prime, which is in n. And so that is all that we needed to show. Here we have showed that g times our big N times g inverse is a subset of our subgroup big N. And we did this using the fact that left and right cosets are equal and got an arbitrary element from our set g big N g inverse and showed that it was in our subgroup big N. Great. So now we're going to do the reverse proof in which we want to show that big N is a subset of our of our conjugation of N by our little g. Great. And so for this reverse proof, we want to do use a similar setup. We're just going to take arbitrary elements little g in g and little n b in big N here. And then we're going to consider the following. And that is that we can write g inverse little n times g in the following way, where we can write our little g on the right of our n as g inverse inverse. And then by our first fact, that means that this will be in n as we have n conjugated by g inverse in this case, where we have g inverse on the left and g inverse inverse on the right, which kind of takes the form of our g n g inverse that we would like. And so if this is in n, that means that we can write it equal to some little n in n. So thus for some, let's just call it n prime, n prime in our big N, we can write g prime n times g is equal to n prime. But then left multiplying by g and right multiplying by g inverse, we can solve for our little n. So that will give us that little n is equal to g times n prime times g inverse. And so here we have taken an arbitrary little n and shown that it is in our group g n g inverse. So thus we have proved our reverse inclusion and that is that big N is a subset of our group g big N g inverse. And since we have this fact here and this fact here, we have proved the set equality as we wanted to do. Great, so now that we've proved one implies two and two implies three, if we can prove that three implies one, we will have proved that these three statements are equivalent. Great. Fortunately for us, this third proof goes rather quickly. So for three implies one, all we want to do is suppose that we have the set equality that we have here. And so that will be to suppose that G times our big N times G inverse is equal to our big N. And then we want to take our elements g from our set from our group g and a little n from our subgroup big N. And this one is very self-explanatory. That will just give us g little n g inverse, which is obviously in g big N g inverse equal to our set big N. So looking at our left and right hand sides, we have shown that g little n g inverse is in our set big N. And by completing this proof, we have proved that those three statements are equivalent. Great. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this next example, we wanna prove that the quotient group of a cyclic group is cyclic. So let's go ahead and write down our setup for that. So we're gonna go ahead and let a, our big G be a group. So we're gonna let B, big G be a group. And we want it to be cyclic, so we're gonna let it be generated by some element of G. We'll call it little g. And so then, we also want to talk about this, the quotient group. And so then we're going to also let our big H be a subgroup of this group G. Great. And so what we want to show is that all elements, let's just call them little g times H, which are in our quotient group G mod out H are of the form G H to the K. And that will be for some just integer K. Great, so if we can do that, we will have proved that the quotient group is cyclic. 
So let's go ahead and get into the proof. So we're gonna begin by supposing that we have some little x which is in our group G, such that we have that xh is in our quotient group G mod h. But we know that G is cyclic, so let me go ahead and write that. Thus, since G is generated by an element little g, that means we can write this element of G here as a power of G. So let's go ahead and write that as x is equal to g to some power, let's go ahead and call it k. Great. And of course this will be for some integer k. And so from here we want to note the following, and that is that g h to the kth power is simply equal to g to the kth power times h, which is simply equal to x to the h, which demonstrates what we wanted to prove. So we have that our quotient group g mod h is generated by our coset g h. Great. And so we have proved here that our quotient group is cyclic. So let's go ahead and get into the next example. And so for this one, we want to suppose that G is a finite group and we have N is a normal subgroup of G. We want to prove that the order of the left coset G N, which is in our quotient group G mod N, divides the order of an element little g in G. Great. So to start, let's go ahead and take some element, arbitrary element from our group G, let's call it little g. And we're going to take it such that the order of this element little g is equal to m. Great. And so now we want to consider the following. We want to consider our coset g times n to the mth power. Well, that's just going to be equal to g to the m times our set times our normal subgroup n. But because the order of G is equal to M, that's just going to be equal to M. But I want you to note that N is the identity element in our quotient group G mod N. So I'll go ahead and write that, that this is the identity of G mod N. But that means that taking this element G N to the mth power gives us the identity element, which means by definition that the order of G N must divide M. Great. So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this one, we want to prove or disprove the following statement, and that is that if n is cyclic and we have the quotient group g mod n is cyclic, that g is cyclic. And I'm going to go ahead and say that this is false and then just give you a quick counter example here. So what I want you to consider is the following qu quotient group, and that is the nth dihedral group mod the group generated by r to the n. And so we can see that obviously, so I'll go ahead and write this, we can see that obviously we have that the group generated by R to the N is cyclic. So we're good to go for this condition here. And we can also very easily see that this quotient group here will be isomorphic to Z2. And of course Z2 is cyclic, so that means that this is cyclic. So we are good here. But we also know that the dihedral group of order n is not cyclic by definition. So what we have given a counterexample to this statement where we found something with a subgroup that is cyclic, a quotient group that is cyclic, but a, I guess I'll call it a parent group that is not cyclic. Great. So that finishes this one off. So let's go ahead and get into our last example. And so for this last one, we want to show that the quotient group of G and the center of G is cyclic, then G is abelian. Great. So let's start by just using the definition of G, the quotient group of G and the center of G being cyclic. So let's go ahead and suppose that G mod the center of G is equal to some generator. Let's go ahead and call that little g times the center of G. Great. And just to save me some time, I'm going to go ahead and set the center of G just being just equal to Z, just to, like I said, save me from writing the center of Z that many times. And so now we want to take two elements from our big G. Let's call them A and B. And so then we can say the following about A and B, that we have A Z is equal to a power of an element from our group G. Let's just call it G to the N times Z by the definition of this being cyclic. And similarly for B, we can write B Z as the product of a power of G and Z as well. But then by definition, that means that we have A is in our coset G to the N Z 
And of course, similarly, that B is in our coset given by G to the M times Z. But that means we can write new definitions for our A and our B. That means we can write A as G to the N times Z1, and we can write B as G to the M times Z2. And this will of course be for some Z1 and Z2, which are both in our group, the center of G there. Great. But then we want to show that G is abelian. So from here, we want to consider A times B. So we're going to consider A times B, but A B is going to be equal to, well, with these new definitions of A and B here, that's going to be equal to G to the N times Z1 times G to the M times Z2. But by the definition of center, we can commute these, these Z1 and Z2 with all elements from our group G. So that means this is going to be equal to Z1, and then this will be times G to the N plus M power times Z2. But of course we can split up that G as the powers of G will commute with themselves, and Z1 and Z2 will commute with all with all elements from our group G, which of course this little g to the power of n plus m will be. And so we can rewrite our expression in the following way. And that will be g to the m times z2 times g to the n times z1, but that is of course equal to b a. And this was of course all possible because we were working with the center of G here, which commutes with all elements of our group G. So we started with the assumption that our quotient group G mod the center of G was cyclic. And we proved that for any arbitrary elements A and B in G, that AB is equal to BA, which is exactly what we needed to prove. And that is that G is abelian. Great. So that finishes this problem off. And that's a good place to stop.